Let's stretch our hands. We're going to pray. You know, as you know, the more amens, the better you will get from Joy, although she's fantastic anyway. But Father God, I thank you for the gift of this amazing woman. Thank you that she's affected our lives many, many times. And I thank you for a big heart for the kingdom. So I pray anoint her as she brings the word. I pray she feel at home and she knows that we love her and we want the best and we are cheering her on as she brings the word. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Dan. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, Oh, my hair is sticking to my microphone. Um, before you put it away, I want you to get your phones out, if that's possible. Hopefully, you've got internet connection. If not, you can connect to the Wi-Fi. Um, someone else will be able to tell you how to do that. I can't. Uh, but I want you to go to a website for me. I love a bit of um, crowd interaction, although no heckling. Don't want any heckling. But uh, like Dan said, you could do... Um, bit of our men and uh, if you are in a live Lincoln North you'll be used to this because it's my latest gimmick that I love to use. Um, menti.com so if you could go to that website and there is a code for you to tap in it's 75 88 20 0 because I want to know your opinion not about my talk <laughs> yet but um, I want to know um, if you could Stand in the middle of your city or town or neighborhood and soak up the mood in 2022, what would it be? I want you to answer that. Would it be hopeful, exhausted, wrung out, anxious, joyful, fearful, anger, might be grief? Sadness or overwhelm, whatever it is, you can, you can answer three times if you've got more than one uh, answer. And um, I recently went to somewhere and uh, I could soak up. I just was like, I feel sick here. I can feel hopelessness. I don't know if you ever have that experience, but what is the mood of your town or your city? So that's at menti.com. And while you're doing that, I just want to give a big shout out for this um, new booklet that we're launching as the ground level exchange team this week. This is called The Mission of God, and uh, it's uh, been put together by some of the team. Big shout out to our incredible theologian, Richard Bradbury, who's got a wonderful brain on his shoulders. And uh, he um, uh, put together a theological paper that is quite meaty, in my opinion. And so you can get that on the uh, website. But uh, we've also made it into a handy booklet that talks about the theological framework of where we find ourselves in the story of God and what our contribution and role is to play in that. And they're available at the ground level stand for two pounds, or get this, you can get five for eight pounds. And uh, I'd love to encourage you to pick these up for people in your church who aren't here because they are faithfully serving God on their front lines in their workplaces. And I think as a, a pastor or a church leader, um, if you could encourage the people who are scattered across your town and city serving God by saying, this is something that I see you doing, and I'm really proud of you, and I want to cheer you on. I think that would really encourage the people in your churches. So uh, that's at the back, and also we'll be highlighting it and profiling it and unpacking it a bit in some of the collabs over the weekend. Week. We're not on the weekend, are we yet? Okay, so uh, here's a little bit of a word cloud. We'll come back to that in a minute. I can't believe it's been three years since we were together, 2019. And... Um, I guess you might agree with me if uh, I summed it up as an unprecedented emotional roller coaster. We've had pandemic, lockdowns, loo roll dramas, anyone remember that? Social distancing, vaccine and mask politics, well known Christian leaders and their highly publicised moral failings, political tension, protests in Washington, parties in Westminster, a painful spotlight on racial and gender injustice, the resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan, famine in Asia and Africa, and we've got war in Europe. I saw something on Instagram recently that sums it up for me. I don't know about you, but I could really go for some precedented <laughs> times. <laughs> Let's look at the mood uh, word cloud then in our towns and our cities, what we've got here. Hopeful, anxious, expectant, Hopeless, 
fearful, tired, recovering, isolated, kingdom, that's good, unmotivated, confusing, frustration, yeah. The Mental Health Foundation said that in the past year, 74% of people have felt so stressed that they've been overwhelmed or unable to cope. I read that 38% of American pastors have felt like quitting at some point this year. And I wondered if there were any UK statistics. And so as I searched, I, fa- I found some psychological research from a team at the University of Lincoln. Uh, some of our friends, actually, um, Laura Edwards and Roger Bretherton, and they looked at clergy, mental and emotional well-being. And I th- maybe some of you would have responded to their research. They found that clergy experienced and reported higher levels of psychological stress. So clergy, like church leaders, pastors. Higher level of psychological stress than average, often because of the emotional, relational, and practical demands on them. This includes being a generalist and a specialist at the same time, the dual role expectation of caring professional and friend, the blurred boundaries between work and the rest of your life, and a strong sense of divine call into the work which generates both passion and also pressure. Here's some quotes on the research. I feel like I've failed people because I've not picked up the phone enough. So I'm quite hard on myself, I know, but there's always more. You could always be doing more. When they talked about people leaving the church, they said, they might dress it up, but they'll say in the end, we're not going to carry on coming to church because of you. We don't like the way you do things. Now, to be able to handle that, I just didn't have the depth of resilience or the sense of security, or if I'm honest, a shield of success that anything else. (coughs) Alongside some participants described physical problems associated with stress like sleeplessness, high blood pressure, irritable bowel syndrome, nearly all the church leaders expressed emotional difficulties at points in their ministry. One uh, participant admitted that they'd considered hurting themselves to escape a heavy workload. They said, at one point, I was stood at the top of the stairs, and I thought, if I fell downstairs now and broke my leg or my wrist or whatever, I just wouldn't have to do it. Don't know about you, but to be honest, I can relate to some of those things, and I've heard some of my colleagues and friends say similar things too. You see, there's never been a more significant moment for us to reflect on our own sense of health as leaders in the church. We are contending for the renewal and rebuilding of our nation, and it's on us to think about ourselves and our health. There's a direct link between the health of us as leaders and the health of the places that we're planted. You've just got to look look at Russia to see that. An unhealthy leader can create all kinds of damage and destruction. The link works both ways, though. A healthy leader can create a healthy environment. Like in Genesis 1, the healthiest leader of them all, our creator God, created a garden that was beautiful and bountiful, an expansive field for the life of the world to explode into, an abundant field for humans to flourish in. And then we see just two chapters later in Genesis 3, The unhealthy leader, the one who had misguided aspirations and unmet needs, creates an unhealthy environment, a pattern that is repeated habitually by the thread of humanity that is wound through history from that story onwards until today. The promise of God in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 connects the flourishing and the healing of the land with the state and heart, of, and heart of God's people. In the same way that the turbulence of this cultural moment has caused leaders stress and anxiety, pursuing and creating a positive environment can shape a person positively. Jeremiah 29 it encourages the exiles in Babylon to seek the health or the shalom, the peace, the wholeness, the well-being of the city that they have been exiled into. And the promise is, if they do that, their health, their uh, shalom will follow. 
And so there's a link between the health of our hearts and the health of our land, our towns and our cities. There is no more compelling reason for us to take stock right now in this conference on this day in the middle of the mood of 2022 and ask ourselves, how are you doing? How am I doing? How are we doing together? And I'm believing this conference will be an opportunity for us to do that. I've no doubt, in fact, I've heard we've got some amazing speakers coming up. There'll be great content, there'll be great information, there'll be incredible vision. But for us to get to where we need to be, for our nation to be everything that God has destined for it to be, then it's uh, revelation and relationship that are going to get us there. And that's what I love about Ground Level. I love that it's an opportunity for us to hear from God's heart and let it land in our heart, revelation, and for us to build safe relationships for the journey together. So let's pray together uh, before I go any further. Holy Spirit, I just want to invite you to land in our hearts right now as we open ourselves up for the truth of who you are and who you've made us to be, I ask that you would illuminate us, illuminate the shadow areas in our hearts, show us and how we can reflect on who we are and how we can grow to be more like you. Pray the prayer of the ancient psalmist, search me, O oh God, and know me. Would you do something this week, Jesus? Amen. Okay, I'd love you to open your Bibles, uh, and it's uh, the book of Jeremiah where I want us to linger a bit today. I'd love you to turn to Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah is someone I would like to be like. He's a courageous and faithful prophet, and he was happy to perform and act out his prophecies in the city streets. He faced public ridicule, rejection, isolation, prison sentences to consistently declare what he heard from heaven. He was really brave. I'd love to be that brave. The portion that we're going to look at comes on the back of a couple of things. So it's just after his famous letter to the exiles, where we've talked about it already. He's asking the exiles to seek the health of the city of Babylon, the brightest and the best that were uh, exiled into that place. But there were also people left in Jerusalem. And so he is continuing this over and over prophetic warning, a little bit like a broken record of destruction in Jerusalem. He's saying Jerusalem will be destroyed. And then you find this prophetic standoff between him and the false prophet Hananiah, where they keep undermining one another and counter prophesying against one another. And uh, we fast forward from this context 10 years later into chapter 32. So Jerusalem's under siege. Jeremiah finds himself in prison because the king is pretty fed up of what he's saying and uh, doesn't like his negative prophecies. And so from the confinement of prison, Jeremiah makes a seemingly spontaneous and rather dubious decision to buy a piece of land. The scriptures tell us this. Jeremiah hears from God who tells him, chapter 32, verse 3, I'm about to give this city into the hands of the king of Babylon. He'll capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape the Babylonians. And then he says, your cousin's going to come to you and he's going to say, buy my field at Ananoth in the territory of Benjamin. That's where Jeremiah and his family uh, grew up. Since it's your right to redeem it and to possess it, buy it for yourself. So just like God said, Jeremiah's cousin did come to see him in the prison of the royal palace. And he told him about the land he could buy according to the right of redemption, which is one of the Hebrew laws. You kind of wonder what's going on in this moment. This isn't just a story of some kind of rich guy living it up in the royal courts and doing a bit of trading to increase his property portfolio. This is a crazy prophetic act in the middle of cultural and political bad mood. Jeremiah's cheeky cousin knows that there's, he's been prophesying this destruction and he knows that his land is going to be worth nothing. And so he's playing it out to try and get Jeremiah to buy the land so he can uh, get off somewhere else with the money and uh, uh, escape the place that's going to be destroyed. This passage is about hope 
And it's about radical obedience that leads to a prophetic promise. The passage is about inheritance and the redemption of property, in which Jeremiah is the kinsman redeemer, a little bit like Boaz, Boaz in the book of Ruth. So at God's direction, Jeremiah pays the purchase price, he signs and seals the deed, and he performs it all in the presence of the witnesses, just like the rules say. And in verse 11, you'll see that it, it refers to the purchase deed in the singular, so uh, one purchase deed, but later describes it as both that which was sealed and that which is open. These title deeds consisted of duplicates, so two. One copy is left open for the contents to be read by anyone who's interested in buying the land. And the second copy is sealed to ensure that there's no tampering uh, that takes place. When it's time to buy back the property, the sealed copy would be unsealed to verify the original agreement. And the only person with authority to unseal the deal is the rightful owner the one that's redeeming the property. So I want you to hold that bit of information in mind because it's going to come in handy in a minute. So this was a ridiculous investment decision, absolutely ridiculous. Buying land in a territory under siege that was about to be destroyed is like investing in a plot of land in the Ukraine that's been completely ransacked, believing one day that it'll be a valuable asset. Do you reckon everyone would be laughing at him? Once Jeremiah finished the transaction, he plays, prays this really long prayer in verse 19. It's a prayer reminding himself of how good God is, the story of God's people, reminding the witnesses of what God said he'll do, and I think it's reminding God as well. Jeremiah's life is a prophetic act towards the land that he lives in and he loves. And it's almost like a lament. This is what you've said you'll do, God. And I have literally given myself for your land because you said to do it. I can hear his emotion in it. And the prevailing mood of Jerusalem in this moment wasn't optimism, so you could buy as much stuff as you want and you're going to get a good return on your investment. It was probably panic, anxiety, fear, and tension. And Jeremiah makes a hopeful call in the middle of his mood. Jeremiah bought the field because of hope. And so to Jeremiah's lament, God replies in verse 27. He says, I am the Lord. Is nothing too hard for me? God describes how angry he is and he offers hope. He says, I'll bring them back. I'll give them one heart, one way. I will inspire them to fear me forever. An everlasting covenant I will build. There's a prophecy about Jesus. And once again, God says, fields will be bought for money. The land will flourish. In other words, this investment that you have made will be worth something to your people. So that's the end of chapter 32. And then we skip over to chapter 33. And Jeremiah is still in prison. And as if to emphasize and to underline and to highlight and to double down on what God is promising, the word of the Lord comes again to Jeremiah. This is called the promise of restoration. And this is the hopeful bit. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you. And I'll tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. There's treasure in the things that he's got to say to us. There's new things every day. Even though he's already said it, he's doubling down on it, on his intention of hope. And he says... I'll bring health to it. I will bring healing to it. I will heal my people and I will let them enjoy abundant peace, shalom and security. I'll bring Judah and Israel back from captivity and we'll re rebuild them as they were before. And I'll cleanse them from all the sin they've committed against me and will forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. Then the city will bring me renown, joy, praise, honor before all the nations that hear of all the good things I do for it. And they will be in awe and will tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace that I provide for it. How good is God? He's good God. He's a healing God. He's a God that brings wholeness and shalom just by his very presence. And there's a future of prosperity, of shalom, of healing 
and restoration, not just for us as individuals, but for our communities, for our towns, for our cities, for the very soil that we place our feet in. But today we're living in the now, but also in the not quite yet of the ancient promise of restoration. As per the research stats, leadership can feel hard because the need seems massive. And we can sometimes feel like a trip or fall down the stairs might get us out of it for a little bit. But I think there are a few things we can learn from Jeremiah. He was ridiculously obedient. He did what God said to him, even though it seemed completely ridiculous. He bought a field as a prophetic act or an investment in the future that he knew he would probably never see. I just want to say thank you to those of you who have invested your lives into something that you know you may never see the full, complete fruit of in your lifetime. I believe God sees you. He sees you serving. He sees you trusting. He sees you <laughs> loving and believing that one day your radical, ridiculous obedience will bear fruit. So Jeremiah was ridiculously obedient, but he also radically trusted God. He throws the ball back in God's court. Jeremiah knows that it's on God, not on him. That it's not on him to work it and to see uh, that fruit. He puts the scrolls in a safe place and he turns his attention and his emotion to God in a really healthy practice of lament and prayer. So we're going to leave Jeremiah and we're going to skip to the end of the Bible. I'd love you to open your Bible at Revelation 5. I love Revelation. It's full of all of those crazy pictures and promises. And this one describes a similar scroll <laughs> and a similar prophetic moment. It's full of emotion. John, the friend of Jesus, is sobbing and weeping over a sealed up scroll. In his vision in the throne room, he cries and he's looking around, sobbing. I imagine, you know, the heaviness of the emotion and he's searching and he's asking, who is worthy to open this scroll? And you kind of sit back and read it and go, John, what's all the drama about? <laughs> what's the emotion all about? Well, after the lamb takes the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall before him and sing a new song. They sing, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God for every tribe and language and people <laughs> and nation. And you've made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. And in Jesus' parable of the hidden treasure in Matthew 13, he teaches this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has to buy the field. And in the parable of the wheat and the tares, which is given immediately before, he defines a symbol of the field as being the whole world. His people are so valuable to him that he will... He's willing to give everything he has. That is, exchange his life for the life of the world. Jesus bought the field for the life of the world. This answers why John was in so much emotional turmoil. He was looking at the title deed of all things. God is praised for creating all things and he appoints his son as heir of all things. However, the world and its inhabitants are presently under... Uh, the influence of Satan, he holds the property in question, having the whole world under his influence. And so the ownership of creation, the whole purpose of the one true creator God, creating humans in his image, hangs in the balance and nobody is found who is worthy to claim it. The weight of what that must have meant to John must have overwhelmed him, and that was his emotion. And I wonder if we sometimes find ourselves in the same place as John. Overwhelmed by the thought that it all hangs in the balance, 
that we're stuck in the reality of the not yet, looking around and wondering if it's all going to fall on us. And although we have the privilege of knowing the end of the story, we are still in the uh, middle bit that Irene calls the wobbly bit in the middle. And we think it's our job to fix it, to make it work, to build something, to create something successful. We forget that the field has already been bought for us, that Jesus came to give life, that he gave his flesh for the life of the world, his flesh for the life of the world, not ours, his. Stress and overwhelm bubble up inside us and spill out in some of the most tragic and difficult places. You've only got to watch the global church. Models that we've admired and looked to to see what stress has done to leaders. It's important to acknowledge that it could happen to any of us. But it's less likely if we work on our self-reflection skills, acknowledging our sin and our weakness and the things that drive us in really unhealthy ways. These could be a desire to achieve. Maybe you can see yourself in the story here. To make a mark on the world. To be the hero. To be known. To feel appreciated and to feel wanted. All of these things are idols if they come before our worship of Jesus. These things must come down so that he can be king in our heart. And this is repentance. And it's the key to our health and our flourishing, but also the health and the flourishing of our nation and the nations. I'm driven by a passion for the city of Lincoln and indeed our nation, driven, that causes an immense amount of frustration and anxiety and sometimes tears and sleepless nights. And I think Paul, my husband, sometimes wonders, why am I so intense? (laughs) What is she on now? I want to see transformation in my lifetime. I want to raise leaders for society who contribute to solutions for poverty and brokenness. And I want to do it yesterday. I want to be in the middle of the action and I want to build something that makes a difference. But I often forget that the field has already been bought. The ultimate sacrifice has already been made. The bill has been paid in full and I've been asked to partner with him but not to do it on my own. To make the outworking of the redemption a reality but to make him famous, not me. It's about mindset, and I am really genuinely preaching to myself. I've got such a tendency to want to fix it, to manage it all. I remember a really powerful encounter that I had with Jesus once, where he said to me, Joy, you're believing a lie that you are carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders and that it's on you. The burden is on you. And to be honest, I couldn't even see that that was a lie. I was like, yeah, it's on me, Jesus. Someone needs to uh, fight for injustice. Someone's got to carry it. And he just said to me, it blew me away. Yes, Joy, I did it. And I'm doing it. And because it's not all on me, it's on him. Jesus came and he gave his flesh for the life of the world, including for the life of me and for the life of you. And knowing that I might not see the fullness of the work in my, of my hands in my lifetime gives me a perspective that if I choose to take it, I have to choose to take it. But if I choose to take it, it allows me to enjoy the journey, to take rest, to honor my family and friendships, to honor the limitations of my body and my mind and my heart. And the promise for Hebrews is the same promise for us that we have the joy of living in now because of Jesus. He has, he will, and he is healing our wounds. He's restoring our land. He's healing our communities. And the partnership he's calling us into is obedience. It's trusting him when he says he's got it. There's an imperative on us as leaders to live from the sense of rest and faith in Jesus and not our own abilities. But it's not just for us so we can have a nice life, so we can feel healthy. It's for the life of the world, in order for us to see our land enjoy the fullest level of health possible, to see rebuilding, to see restoration, to see renewal in our land, and to not live at the brink of the top of the stairs, about to throw ourselves off. 
but in the mindset of green pastures, beside quiet waters, in the field that he is calling us into. So the promise of Jeremiah 33 talks about wounds being healed and about sins being forgiven. And the wounds of our heart often lead to us striving to prove something. They've usually got something to do with not feeling good enough or feeling adequate or acceptable, which then propel us on to leave a mark on the world to prove that we are adequate or acceptable, to be central to the story, to find acceptance in achievement. And our job isn't to buy the field. That bit's been paid for. Our job is to partner with the landowner, to make sure that we're fit enough for the field work, to stay in the field that he's created us uniquely for. So the most important leadership work we can do is to lead ourselves first, to live from a position of humility in order to receive the healing in our hearts and to clean up the wounds and the pain that cause us to strive to do things in our own strength. And I think there's some practices and habits we can engage in to help with this. I want to introduce you to the stress box. I wanted to do this live, but you'll see why it might have got too messy. So here's one I made earlier. I want you to imagine this box here is you and the water is the stress that pours into your life. Sometimes it comes like a trickle and sometimes it comes like a torrent. Now everyone only has so much capacity and so at some point this thing is going to overflow and you are going to feel overwhelmed and potentially make a mess in places that might shock and surprise you and disappoint and hurt other people. But what if I told you that every time you worship Jesus, it's like doing this. Every time you rest, it's like doing this. Every time you pray and meditate on scripture, every time you make time to relax or you meet with a trusted friend and get something off your chest. Even if the stress keeps on coming, as long as you have enough small, healthy habits, the box will never overflow and you won't have to get overwhelmed. I was quite proud of my drill skills and my Instagram reel abilities. That's the only way I know how to make videos. So uh, the research I referred to earlier acknowledged that the leaders most resilient to stress and anxiety were those who engaged in what they called religious coping strategies. When I talked to uh, the researchers, they said, to tell you that you already know uh, what to do and you're doing it really well. Things like Sabbath and rest, recreation and celebration, keeping clear and healthy boundaries, confession and repentance of our sin, meditation on the word of God, worship of our hearts towards Jesus, generosity, celebration of others and their success. And all of these things serve to remind us that we're not God. We're human and we've got limitations. And it's a spiritual discipline as an act of worship to acknowledge that. We've been called to work, but also to play and to rest in his fields, not to buy or to dig our own. This is similar to Jeremiah chucking the ball back to God into his court and being ridiculously obedient and radically trusting of God. We see the work that needs doing, and yet we're happy to step back and take Sabbath and rest and to say, it's not all on me, it's on him. Whether your platform as a leader finds you in the Sunday morning pulpit or in the boardroom or in the classroom or on the ward round or at the school gate, the people that we are serving as leaders in our communities need to know the promise of restoration isn't just a fable, but it's a true story. And it's one that they are invited into. The people we serve need a prophetic act of rest and peace. They need leaders who know how to drill the holes in the box and how to walk into the fields that Jesus bought in the pathways of green pastures. And they need leaders who can show them how to do it as well. Edwin Friedman is a Jewish rabbi and a therapist, and he co coined the term a non-anxious presence. This is someone who can carry the shalom of God into situations to help other people experience that peace too. We need non-anxious anxious presence people in the frenzy of 21st century materialism, consumerism, individualism. Our communities need people who model healthy families, healthy boundaries, psychological and emotional maturity, not just spiritual maturity. They need people who can show them how to slow 
down, as well as trusting in something way bigger than themselves. A story more ancient, yet more futuristic, more costly, yet more generous, more impactful, yet more slow and steady and enduring than the story that they're already putting their trust in. You see, the mood of us as leaders affects the mood of the places and spaces we inhabit. And the promise of God in Jeremiah 33 is that the mood in our cities will be moods of praise and honor and joy and shalom and blessing and prosperity. And the invitation today is for us to join God in what he's doing by allowing him to heal us first so that we can bring healing to the land. I'm just going to finish in a moment. I'd love the band to um, come up and join me. But one of the brilliant things uh, about being together, like I said, is that this is a safe space or we can create a safe space for revelation to land in our hearts and for relationships to be built and nurtured. I recently, during lockdown, qualified as a professional leadership coach and the biggest thing, it's been such a fascinating journey for me, the biggest thing I learned is that really good questions and a safe space are the container that facilitates transformation. And so I want to share a couple of stories with you and then I'm going to Uh, My gift to you is some good questions, which I think if you engage with this week, will facilitate revelation and relationship for the week ahead. There's an invitation for us this week to reflect on the posture of our leadership. Are we about to fall down the stairs, chuck ourselves down the stairs so that we can get out of what feels too hard? Or are we walking with peace and joy in his field? What would it look like to let him guide you as a non-anxious presence into the field? I'd love to introduce you to a few leaders who I think have done this really well. They demonstrate prophetically to the world the kind of non-anxious presence that we all need. This is Will Ford. Not not this, this. (laughs) He he, He inherited an old iron cooking pot used by his ancestors who were African-American slaves. This is one of my favorite stories, so if you've ever been around me, then you might have already heard it. They used the cooking pot um, for cooking and washing their clothes, but also for secretly for prayer. The slaves were Christians, and their slave master refused to let them pray because he didn't want them to get any kind of hope for freedom. And so in the middle of the night, they would sneak out into the barn on the farm and they'd turn this cooking pot upside down and put uh, rocks underneath it to make a kind of acoustic block. And then they'd lie on their bellies and then they would pray with all of their might for the freedom of their descendants because they didn't have the faith to pray for their own freedom. And they also prayed a blessing on the descendants of their slave owners. And so when slavery was abolished, a teenage girl kept the pot and she passed it down to her daughter, Harriet Lockett, who passed it to her daughter, Nora Lockett, who passed it to her son, Wilford. He passed it to his son, Wilford Jr. And he passed it to his son, Wilford III. Wilford III uses the pot to tell the story of the power of prayer and social change. And at a prayer event in uh, uh, Washington at the Lincoln Memorial on Martin Luther King Day, Will met his friend, a guy called Matt, who is a white man for, from Virginia. It's the first time they'd ever met. And they were brought together prophetically. And Martin Luther King's family were there. And they prayed over him. They had prayed over Matt and they prayed over Will and they prayed and commissioned them to heal the racial divide in America. To walk into the reality of Dr. King's dream that said the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit together around the table of brotherhood. And after about 10 years of these guys working together and being becoming best friends, they're leading Uh, this movement for social change. Matt's dad died. And as Matt's sorting out all the affairs of his dad, they discover that Matt Lockett's ancestors, makes me cry every time, were the slave owners of Will Ford's 
and sisters. And not only that, but on the very ground that the slaves had prayed in that field, on the boundary of Matt Lockett's family farm near Sailors Creek, Virginia, the last shot in the Civil War in America was fired because of their prayers, because of their non-anxious presence. The ancestors of Will Ford knew how to walk in the field, how to trust God for a future they would never see. But generations later, God brought together two sons for purpose and transformation. You can read more about their story in the book, The Dream King. It's one of my favorites. And then I want to introduce you to this guy, Dave King. He is a hero of mine. He spoke at last year's uh, ground level online conference. Uh, He's from Salford and he tells the story of walking around the city as a little boy, holding his dad's hand as they walked the streets of a run-down city. It was deprived, it was full of violence and brokenness, unemployment and pain. As, As they walked, they would pray. Dave's dad taught him what it looked like to walk in the field as a non-anxious presence, walking through circumstances like multiple burglaries in their home, attacks and aggression from gangs. He taught him how to pray and believe for restoration and shalom in their city. And Dave says this, I first learned to bless every church I passed. And in time, a good number of those churches came together to pray for the city. Once churches started praying together, they increasingly started working together for the good of the city. And over time, I learned how to pray strategically for all key aspects of the life of our city, from government to education, from health to arts and leisure. I also learned to pray for and honor those God had placed in authority while also praying for connection with the people of the city so that we could stop being known for complaint and criticism and abuse of those in leadership. And I learned about the great gift of creativity that had been placed in our city and the need for a hub where creativity could be nurtured and grown. He said it wasn't a journey of weeks or months, but it was generations. He says, looking back, there were many highlights. Here are a few of them. A number of the churches in the Salford area now count their Sunday attendance in uh, high hundreds rather than low tens. There's been great growth in vision and political aspiration for how good the city can become. There's been a significant increase in GCSE pass rates and all the city's high schools have been rebuilt. All of them have been rebuilt. Many physical changes have taken place in the city that have helped lift the atmosphere. Salford's economy has grown and continues to grow at a higher rate than the national average. And the place that they would stand, the field that they would walk in, is now this, Media City UK. It's created as an international arts and media hub and it attracts talent and investment while giving opportunity and access to local entrepreneurs and business people. Dave's living in the legacy of his dad's prayers and his own prophetic act to live in the field for the life of the world. The mood in Salford, praise, joy, renown, honor because of Jesus and the way he's answered the prayers. Lastly, this is Katie. She's my friend. She's, um, she really inspires me. She's part of the church community that I lead and she Uh, works in a really, really high-pressure sales environment. She just won top salesperson of the year for her company. She's like a non-anxious presence. Because of her faithfulness and uh, telling people about Jesus, her boss lets her pray in their team meetings together. She told me that um, uh, she was praying for members of her team and Uh, God told her that her boss had an addiction problem. And after um, a year of sitting in that, in a non-anxious way, God gave her an opportunity to speak to him and he was able to go and get help and support. And another woman that uh, she worked with, God told her that she'd experienced childhood abuse. How hard is that to kind of take that on and think, how am I ever going to say that? God told me, by the way, that you were abused as a kid. But she did it. 
about a year after God told her. And she did it in such a non-anxious, such a peaceful, such a caring and loving way that her friend began to seek help. How could this wonderful God know and see me? I've been seen. The most special thing I think about Katie is that she's more bothered about what God thinks of her than what other people think. And this helps her walk in the field, helps her bring that peaceful field to others. So I'd love you to close your eyes. I'd love you to just ask the Holy Spirit to spark imagination in your mind. What would the fruit of the future field look like if you were the most healthy version of you? What would it look like for you to be a non-anxious presence to be radically obedient and revitalized by the power of his goodness in the world around you. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate to us what that looks like? Show us way above what we could ask or imagine. What could our towns, our cities look like in the future because of our investment and our obedience and our trust in you? Just before we get too carried away, because you can keep on that track, but I, I think it's really important to just ask and imagine what would it look like if we didn't do that? What kind of things might not change? You know, you guys, the stakes are really high. 2022, the history books will record how we as a church have responded and loved and sown and invested our lives into this land, but then also thrown the ball back in God's court and said, it's on you now, God. You said praise and honor and renown would uh, be seen in our towns and our cities. And so we're believing and we're trusting you. Heal my heart first. And like I said, I've got a couple of good questions uh, that I think if you really grapple with them and take them and talk to your friends, hear about them, I believe that revelation and relationship will be deeper by the end of the, um, the week. Um, they'll come up on the screen. I recently worked out how you can make a QR code. Like, not just media people do it, apparently. <laughs> Anyone can do it. So, um, so here you go. Um, it, probably you might want to come nearer the front afterwards and like take a picture of it because it doesn't. I tried it earlier. It doesn't work from the back. But there's um, there's these six questions. Uh, it'll take you to a document, and then there's about 20 other questions you can use, which is just added value as a gift from me. Here are the questions. What's the prophetic act God's calling you to, even if it looks like a ridiculous investment? Do you know what the field is that God's called you into? What would it look like for you to walk peacefully into that field? In what ways have you been striving and stressing in order to make it happen by yourself and in your own timing? What are the idols that you're worshiping? What holes are you drilling into your stress box? Why don't you stand to your feet? I don't think if you just let those questions wash over you, they'll do anything. You have to take them and you have to like grapple with them and you have to speak them out loud with your friends. Hopefully it'll give you a bit of uh, conversation starters. Let's pray and then we're going to declare and sing over ourselves, over our hearts, over our nations, a blessing of God and his favor and his goodness. So Jesus, we thank you that you bought the field. We thank you that for the life of the world, you gave your flesh so we didn't have to do that. And today in this safe space, we come before you and we, we repent. We repent of the things that we've held higher, maybe even just in our own subconscious, higher than you, looking good and achieving and success and getting stuff done. And we turn our face towards you and we humbly ask 
Would you heal our land, Jesus? Would you heal our land? Amen.